very special to me. You've been coming, asking for more. You came with something on your heart, asking the Father to revive you. here to do that. So just as we enter into this moment where we're about to dig into the Word and, and then release this next stage of what God wants to do amongst us, I just want you to take a moment and just say, Lord, I want more of you tonight. I don't care what it looks like. And I'm going to be talking about the baptism of water and fire for revival. The baptism of water and fire. You realize that we've got two baptisms in our life, right? We have a water baptism and we have a fire baptism. But yet, you know, you can go through your entire Christian life and actually not even get baptized. Did you know that? I don't recommend it. <clears throat> but there are some Christians that just don't get baptized. I don't know why. But something happens when you enter into baptism, both water and fire. You know, our daughter, uh, she's about 31 years now, uh, old, and uh, when she was in her early 20s, she went with YWAM down to New Zealand. And when she left home, she had not yet gone through water baptism. She just, I don't know why, we didn't pressure, we didn't, you know, it wasn't, we didn't make it a thing. We prayed though that the Holy Spirit would make it a thing. She got down to YWAM and she had an encounter with God. She got filled with the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden, she said, I needed to get baptized. And she went down to the river. Take me down to the river. <laughs> down to the river. <laughs> and she got baptized. And we were like 4,000 miles away. Couldn't go to it. But our hearts were with her. Because she finally made that decision to enter into water baptism. And yet... What thrilled us as much as that, or even more, was the fact that she had received a baptism by fire by being filled with the Holy Spirit for the first time. We are baptized by water and by fire. Okay? You know, the disciples, they also were baptized by water and by fire. Do you know that? Who baptized the disciples by water? John the Baptist. John the Baptizer. The baptizer they were baptized in water as they met Jesus. Before they met Jesus. Sometime in the first encounter with Jesus. Their first encounter with Jesus was water baptism. <clears throat> what happened later? They had a second baptism that came from Jesus. It was a fire baptism. They waited 10 days in this upper room. They prayed. And Pentecost came. And they were baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. They had two baptisms.
you know, Matthew 3, if you want to turn there with me. It has this great story. And we see Jesus and John the Baptist interacting. And in Matthew 3, 11, it says, and, and this is John the Baptizer talking to the people. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. Whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Two pictures of fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? I'm going to stop there. Why do you think that was? He's like, you're greater, right? I'm just John, your cousin. Right? But look what Jesus said. But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus didn't baptize John because Jesus was saying we need to enter into John's baptism. Even Jesus needed to enter into John's baptism. Jesus needed to be baptized by water, by John, because it was John's baptism that kind of came to us in the form of water. If Jesus had baptized John, that would have negated that. So fulfilling all righteousness meant that Jesus had to be baptized by John in water. Get it? Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Verse 1 of chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And then we know in Luke chapter 4, verse 14, that it says that Jesus returned from the wilderness in the weakness of the Spirit, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Something happened. Jesus came into power through the baptism of the Holy Spirit as he came up out of the water. Fulfilling all righteousness. Receiving two baptisms. The Spirit descending on a dove. Like a dove. Like a dove. John gave us the baptism of water, which is repentance. Jesus gave us the baptism of fire, which is power. Our focus on water baptism has put out the fire in our churches. Our focus on water baptism has put out the fire in our churches. Do you realize that when water comes in greater quantity than the flame, that the flame gets doused? But when fire comes in greater quantity than the water, the water gets transformed into steam. It's not lost. So when we ask for more of his presence through the fire baptism, 
we do not lose what we gained in our water baptism. It gets transformed into something greater, something more dynamic. Water as a vapor takes on the nature of the spirit, ethereal, able to blow with the wind. It transforms and becomes otherworldly, reaching up into the heavens. Water untouched by fire simply lays down on the ground. We are called to, to pursue a baptism of fire because it will transform our water baptism. You know, you know the story of Elijah, right? Remember the prophets of Baal? Remember the, the big contest that he had? What did he do? He said, go ahead, call down fire. Let's see whose God will answer. All these prophets cutting themselves. Oh, come, send the fire. Elijah baptized the sacrifice in water. He doused it. He immersed it. He made it so it was impossible for that thing to be caught on fire of its own accord. By any earthly manner. He baptized that sacrifice in water. And he said, dig a trench and pour some more water around it. Fill it up. Lord, show them who's God. And what does it say? It says in 1 Kings 18.38, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the baptized burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. The water was turned to steam. Transformation took place in that moment. Two baptisms took place on that sacrifice. Everything is transformed by water first and fire second. Everything. Scripturally. Prophetically. You're transformed. We just talked about this baptism of water and fire. But you realize that also the earth and Israel were transformed by water and by fire. If we turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. It says this, starting verse 5. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water, and through water, by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But at the same word, or by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come, like a thief, 
and then the heavens will pass away. away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. You see, the earth was formed by water. It was judged by water. It will be judged by fire and it will be reformed by fire. Why? That's how God transforms things. He's after the new heavens and the new earth. Just like he's after the new you and the new you. He transforms things through water and fire. It could either be done as a judgment or as a sacrifice. It's your choice. It's your choice. But it's going to happen. What about Israel? What about Israel? Why? Those people. I would not want to be in their shoes. But, you know, they taught us something, right? We learn a lot by reading the stories that are preserved for us about Israel because they teach us about ourselves. That's really what God is doing through these. He's giving us a perfect foreshadowing of what he wants to do in you and me and in us, right? So Israel, Exodus 14, we got the account of Israel. They're in Egypt. And what are they, what's happening at that point? Pharaoh behind, the Red Sea before. God. And Moses puts a staff in the water. And the Red Sea opens. And metaphorically speaking, swallows them up as they go down on dry land under the water. And as a body of people, the first person that entered had not exited the other side before the other, the last person had entered, which means that at one point, all of Israel was under the water, being baptized by water. They were baptized by water in that moment. <coughs> See, God got Israel out of Egypt through water baptism. They repented. It's, it's baptism of repentance. You know, repent, understand what that means? Return. They were returning to their land that had been promised them. They were repenting. They were going back to the place that their father and great-grandfather and great-great-grandfather had left. Israel. Over 400 years they had been in Egypt. And they were repenting, returning to their promised land. But the problem is, is that God hadn't got Egypt out of Israel. You realize that on the other side of that Red Sea, it was only a few days' walk 
and they would have been in the land of their promise. A few days walk. And yet, something happened. Obviously, God said, well, you know, I didn't want you to go directly there. I want you to go to Mount Sinai because we have this thing called a covenant that we need to make with one another. And I've got a few stone tablets that I know you're going to break. But, you know, well, we've got to go through that because there's stuff that needs to be, you know, sorted out between you and us, you and me. And so here they are, Mount Sinai, and then they take this walk down to the border of the promised land. Moses calls a group of guys and says, go scout out the land. Prove to everyone that it's going to be a cake walk because God is with us. They come back. Numbers 13 and 14 is the story. And what happens is they say, we can't do it. We can't. They're too big. They're giants. Uh, 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 uh. And God says, okay, this is, a, this is a defining moment for you. And he judges Israel. And he, re- he says, okay, you need to go through your second baptism. Do you know how Israel went through its second baptism? They lived for 40 years under a fire. They lived for 40 years under a purifying fire. A cloud by day, a fire by night. But they lived under it. And what does it say? It says that after 40 years, all those who had complained and said that we can't do it, had been judged by death. They died in the wilderness. And when Israel had been purified by fire, God took them in to the promised land. They received their inheritance. You see, Here's something that's important about that. The water baptism was like a one-day trip, right? They didn't repeat that. But the fire, they had to live under for 40 years to complete the purification process. 40 years of continuous fire. And we get baptized in water once and call it good. We need to enter into this continual pursuit of the fire of God. Remember, the fire doesn't negate your water baptism. The presence of the Holy Spirit to transform you. You're called to enter the waters of baptism for repentance. And the fires of baptism <clears throat> for consecration. That's how you get the power. You get set aside. You consecrate something in order to give it a holier and higher purpose. You take the common, you baptize it in fire, and it becomes sacred. Every one of us, when we get baptized in fire, we get consecrated. We get set aside. The common stuff in our life no longer is called common, it becomes sacred. Purification takes place. And we become something other than what we think we are. We become sons of the Most High God. 
daughters of the Almighty God. Walking in our inheritance. Living out of the promised land. Numbers 31. This is a good verse to read with me. Numbers 31, verse 21 to 23 says this. Then Eliezer the priest said to the men in the army who had gone to battle, This is the statute of the law that the Lord has commanded Moses. Only the gold and silver, the bronze, the iron, the tin, and the lead, everything that can stand the fire, you shall pass through the fire, and it shall be clean. Nevertheless, it shall also be purified with the water for impurity. And this next verse is important. Whatever cannot stand the fire, you shall pass through the water. God is saying that there is a process of consecration. His ultimate is the gold and the silver and the bronze. He's after refining metals. And he says that has to be purified by water baptism and fire baptism. But he also acknowledges that there are some things that can't stand the heat. You put a cloth garment in the fire and it's not going to withstand the heat. And so he says for those things that are weak. I have a, a consecration under water only. But he ideal, his ideal is for fire and water. You're familiar with the verse, um, uh, 1 Corinthians 3.12? There's gold, silver, bronze, wood, hay, stubble. It's all going to be tested. It's going to be tested by fire. Some is going to burn, some isn't. This is what God is talking about. There is a consecration that takes place through this fire baptism. Exodus 32, 19 to 20. You know, Israel, uh, I wouldn't... Want, I wouldn't have wanted Moses' job. Honestly. <laughs> that guy had more patience. Uh, he lost it. You know, We know he lost it, right? I probably would have too. Moses is up on the mountain. He's getting these commandments. The law. God writes on these stone tablets with his finger. And Moses is coming down the mountain. And as he's coming down the mountain, he hears in the distance a sound. And he realizes that there's a party going on. And he smashes the tablets when he notices that they're worshiping a golden calf. And in that moment, this thought enters Moses' mind. Because he had heard the pattern from God. How do you purify your people? How do you cleanse them from sin? Well, fire and water, right? How do you do that? It says in these verses, 32, Exodus 32, 19. And as soon as he came near the camp, and saw the calf and dancing, Moses' anger burned hot. And he threw the tablets out of his hand and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. Moses took their idolatry 
And he burned it in the fire, cast it in the water, and made them drink. And in that act, he purified his people. See, God transforms our idolatry through that type of action. He takes the things that are not right in us, he burns them up, and through water and fire, he cleanses us and says, you are still my people. Grace is at the heart of the gospel. Grace is something that says, I, no matter no matter how badly I smash things up, the Ten Commandments, every single one of them I broke. And yet, the grace of God says I have a plan. Grace allows you to go through the water and through the fire to be cleansed. And to receive a purification that sets you apart and calls you holy. Sets you apart and says, there is still hope for you. I have a plan for you that cannot be negated. Amen. Amen. But the key is you have to let him baptize you. Yes. You realize that we have all these things that we do to try to fix ourselves. Right? We have a plan. I, I always have a plan. Somehow it just doesn't jive with his plan. But I have a plan. But his plan requires no effort on my part. And that is the difference. It's the entire difference. You see, my plan always means that I have to do something to get right with God, to receive His Spirit. I've got to do something. I've got to, I, I got to repent of this sin before He'll give me the Holy Spirit. No. He just says, ask. Oh, I've got to go make things right with this brother before He'll give me the Holy Spirit. No, just ask. You see, all of my plans involve my effort. All of his plans involve his effort. There's a couple of images in E. Stanley Jones' book that I was reading this morning, uh, The Christ of Every Road, that I think are really powerful. And one is this, and it's the picture of water. And you're, you, you, you want to take a ship through to a lake that's up here. How do you get a ship that is on a river down here into a lake that's at a higher elevation? You have to take that ship and you have to put it into a lock. And then in that lock, you have to close the doors to the old source of water. Seal them shut. Close them off from its former path. And all you do, just open the doors a little bit and let the water from the higher level come down and lift the ship up. There's no effort. None at all. You open the door, the ship sails up because the water from the higher level comes down and lifts that ship elevating it. Now, if the ship wants to go the opposite direction, if the ship wants to go to a lower level, there's a lot of work involved in that. You have to turn on electric pumps. You have to put that ship into the same dock, and then you have to turn the engine on, and you have to, by effort, lower the ship. You see, God's ability to raise us takes no effort on our part. But everything we do that has effort in it is actually something that lowers us. Your effort is useless to God when it comes to being pure, and purified, and able to receive from Him. There's nothing you can do to make
made yourself right with him. Except to ask. Except to receive. Except to allow him to do it for you. There's another picture. It has to do with fire. And he's Stanley Jones. He was out at a village and he was walking around the village and then he walked down below the village and he came to this pond and he looked at it and he said, this tiny foul stain, this tiny foul pool stained by the life of the village. That's such a euphemism. What was it full of? It was a place where all the sewage from the town had rested, stained by the life of the village. And he said, in this moment, I had this awareness that the only way that this pool, stained by the life of the village, could be made clean, drinkable water again, without effort. See, as a human, you know, with technology, we can put it through pumps and filters and ionize it and zap it and make it clean again. But he said, without effort, the only way for that pool of water to become pure and drinkable again is for the water of that pool to simply yield itself to the sun above. Allow itself to be evaporated, lifted up into the heavens, and deposited as pure white snow on the mountains to feed the village once more with fresh water. See, these are pictures that you need to have in your mind when you think about receiving the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does the work. God does the work. We receive. We yield to the baptism of water and fire that he offers to us. We receive. We yield. The very means of our salvation and our consecration, however, are often used by the enemy to destroy us. You realize that? But Jesus is able to turn even those into transformational moments. Mark 9, uh, 20 to 23, is the story of a, a father who brings his son to Jesus. And he says, Jesus, My son is tormented by demons. And it's, he says this to Jesus. He says, verse 22, this demon it has often cast him, my son, into fire and water to destroy him. Can you do something? Jesus says, can I? <laughs> you don't know who you're talking to. But you see, Satan wanted to destroy by fire and water. Jesus came in, transformed that moment, and saved that boy. Isaiah 43, 2, it says this. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. Okay, you're a prisoner of war in a place called Babylon. Taken as a boy, turned into a eunuch, made to serve a foreign king. And one day, some men come and they create a law that says you've got to bow before this statue. If you don't, 
you'll be cast into a fiery furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had a decision to make. And in Daniel chapter 3, they say, we won't bow. Not going to do it. Our God can save us. But even if he doesn't, What boldness. What boldness. But even if he doesn't, our God can save us. We know it beyond a shadow of doubt. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow. Not going to happen. The rage fills the king's eyes. And these former men who had his favor all of a sudden were the recipients of his demonic rage. He heated up this furnace and cast them in. And the men throwing them in perished because of the heat. And then King Nebuchadnezzar looks. Didn't I cast three men into the fire? And now I see four, and the fourth is like the Son of God. And they're walking in the flames. Whoa. That was a transformational moment. See, the enemy wants to come and kill, destroy, take away. He wants to use fire and water to kill you, to kill your faith. He wants you to enter into works. He wants you to live out of your water baptism and not enter into your fire baptism. He wants you to die in the wilderness. But God said, I will be with you in the water. And I will be with you in the fire. And nothing can harm you. Nothing can harm you. Because I, I am, will be with you. I see four men. Psalm 66, 12 says this. We went through fire and through water. Yet you have brought us out into a place of abundance. What was the promised land? It was a place of abundance. You see, Jesus is after you and your promised land. He's after your place of abundance. And, you know, why am I talking so forcefully about being baptized in the Holy Spirit? About being filled with Him and receiving a baptism of fire yet again for some of us who have had it happen before. It's not enough to do it once. Why am I? Because I want you to enter into a place of abundance. I want your good. I want the best for you. The best comes when you allow him to do everything for you. Purify you. Transform you. Bring you into this place where you don't have to do it. Yeah. I want you to walk in abundance. I want you to enter your promised land. You know, I had a dream at the beginning of this week. And it went. It was an interesting dream. And in this dream, I, you know, there's an event, something like this. I wasn't saying that it was this event, just an event like this. Just so you're clear. <laughs> 
And I walked up, and there was a, an audience, and there were people on the stage and singing, and you know, things were happening. And I had in my hand this big, huge copper bundle that was about a foot round and about 12 feet long, thick thing, you know, like wrapped in plastic, a big, huge electric cord, basically. And I took it, walked up on the stage, got up on this ladder, opened up the ceiling tiles, and stuck it up in there and hooked it up. And as I came down the ladder, all of a sudden these massive, wild, crazy sparks, and not sparks, like arcs, you know, like, look, I am your fiber. <laughs> Crazy, wild stuff was happening. And I was like, cool. Wow. But then I looked through the spark and arcing of this power just busting out all over the place. And I saw the faces of the people, and they were frightened. They were terrified that this was going to kill them. And in that moment, I made a decision pastoral decision and I went up the ladder which and I looked up there and I saw it was beginning to smoke fire by day or by night cloud by day and I unhooked this cable took it behind the stage and laid it down and the next day I went into this meeting and the people around the meeting they were saying cancel tonight's meeting because the people want a professional to hook up the power. And in that moment, I understood what was happening. You see, what did the people say to Moses? This glowing face of yours freaks us out. You've been touched by the fire. And it's scary. It's dangerous. You see, fire is dangerous. It will kill you. That may be what we need, but it'll kill you. And what did they say to Moses? You go be our professional. You go talk to God. Whatever he says to you, we'll do it. You see, and I think that it's, it, it, it wasn't talking about you, this dream. It was talking about the state of the church because I... I work with pastors all over the world. And this is the state that we often find our churches in. The power of God terrifies people. Because we have not done a good job of preparing them to understand that they need a baptism of fire. We've contented ourselves with water when we should have been pursuing fire. And I'm going to ask you tonight to say to yourself, am I willing to be plugged in and receive the fire? That's what this is all about. We need Him. We need His presence. And we don't need it from last decade. We need it today. We need to be purified on a daily basis. We need to be consecrated on a daily basis because we need to be holy and powerful and transformative on a daily basis. Russell Jerry. moments. Let's stand up for a moment. Let's just uh, stretch our legs. Maybe you want to do some uh, touching your toes as was it can. Just, uh, just some star jumps. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's beginning to rain. Hear the voice of the Father saying, whosoever will come and drink of the water. I promise to pour my spirit.
spirit out on my sons and my daughters. If you're thirsty and dry, I come to the sky. It's beginning to rain. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord has something for us. I'm just so encouraged by Shannon's word this evening. Uh, it's about fire. Okay, you can sit down now. You must excuse me. I I uh, used to play rugby, very wild rugby. Got kicked in the teeth when I was a teenager and got knocked out. It's true, you do hear bells. And uh, and then uh, I ended up about, uh, I think now maybe, I don't know, 20 years later, losing a tooth. And then I had a crown put in and I was teaching the Bible in January. And I felt something clicking in my mouth and I said to the guys, I had men's Bible studies in coffee shops all over the place. And I said to the guys, I can feel this tooth clicking. And they laughed. And while I was teaching, it fell right out. And so I'm having, I'm having another tooth put in, but I wear a little false tooth, but I haven't put it in tonight. So I hope it doesn't scare you. I fit right in downtown where I minister at the mission. People think I'm a very tough pastor. And uh, yeah, I went to the dentist, took the roof out that was still there, and he said, we can put a tooth in for you there. Give me $4,000 and I'll sort it out you. <laughs> so, uh, if anyone wants to buy a pair of shoes that are hardly used, I'm selling all my clothes so I can buy it too. <laughs> yeah, and I, I actually am totally uh, insensitive about this jolly tooth, but my wife is looking across at me, she's going, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm her disgraceful uh, husband, uh, the, you know, the toothless guy. <laughs> Next time you see me, I hope you admire my tooth, it's a very expensive one when I eventually get it. Okay, enough about my tooth. Good heavens. Um, it's about water and about fire. I gave my life to Jesus in 1970 and I realized in this room there are a number of patriarchs and that's relatively recent for some of us here uh, to get born again in 1970. I was 13 years old, so you can calculate my age now your fingers and your toes. Um, I'm 62. Uh, I was 13. When I was 14, I had the most profound experience with God, and I was powerfully baptized in fire. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I was born again in 1970. In 1971, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. The, the Pentecostals would call it the second work of grace, and um, uh, the truth of the matter is, my salvation was a profound experience. My baptism in the Holy Spirit was an even more profound experience. I got up early next, uh, next day, Monday, and I went to school early to tell my friends that I'd be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they said, what? I said, yeah, I speak in tongues now. They said, what? I said, and they make it and they said, oh. <laughs> But it was profound. Many of my classmates got saved. Some of them went into the ministry. I started preaching when I was 15. And, and at the time, it didn't seem at all unusual. I look back and I think, that is a bit unusual. But what caused it? I, I didn't have a pastor who was encouraging me. People were phoning him up to speak to Pastor Chadwick. He called me and said, listen, what's going on here? And I said, no, I don't know about that. I said, I've just been preaching, healing, casting out demons, getting people filled with the Holy Spirit, baptizing folks in water. And he said, well, that was probably the reason that they're phoning to speak to Pastor Chadwick. <laughs> um, and my wife, too. Some of you were here last year. She was at a boarding school. Uh, one of the teachers spoke to the, the prefects. She was always a pretty good, you know. She was a prefect. And uh, this teacher got talking about the baptism and the Holy Spirit, as you do when you're a teacher talking to pupils. Actually, you know, it was most unexpected. But Harry knew she was born again, and she knew this is what she needed. This is what she wanted. This is what she was missing. And that night, when everyone was sleeping, she got up in her pajamas, and she went twinkle toeing down the passageways, and she knocked on the teacher's door. The teacher came to the door and said, yes, what do you want? She said, I want you to pray for me. I want the Holy Spirit. And she said, oh, well, yes, you know, maybe come back tomorrow. And Mary said, no, 
no, only now. And she took her in and she began to explain it. Carrie said, I know all about this. I know the scriptures. This is what I want. Just pray for me. And she prayed for her. And she was a Pentecostal teacher. And Carrie was a Dutch reformed, very conservative. She's always been very, very much in control of herself and her husband and her children and her family <laughs> and the neighbors and everybody that lives in our area. And uh, the teacher prayed for her and she got filled with the Holy Spirit. She spoke a few words in tongues and the teacher took off like, you know, when you've, you've got those um, crackers of bonfire night, you know, firecrackers. And in England it says, light the blue touch paper. Does it say that in Canada? On the end of the cracker, it's got this blue paper, and it's got a little thing that says, light the blue touch paper. <laughs> it usually says, do not hold, stand back. Right. And so, when Harry spoke in tongues, Jesus lit the blue touch paper of the teacher, who took off like a little rocket. <laughs> and Harry was very confident. But on the inside, I must write a poem about that. <laughs> right. And next day, when her friends saw her, they said to her, What's happened to you? Do you have a new boyfriend? <laughs> her eyes were all shiny. She hadn't even met me yet. You should have seen her eyes shine then. But God had lit the blue touch paper. And she said, until tonight, I'll tell you. And during the day, they were all bursting with, with wanting to know, wanting to know. And that evening, she took uh, three of her friends to the teacher's room. And again, and there was also oh, sort of very surreptitious, you know. And they got all sat down there, and the teacher just did a little talk. And then she said to Kerry, You pray from that end, I pray from this end. Kerry had been filled with the Holy Spirit a day. She had a Catholic friend, a Methodist friend, and a Dutch Reformed friend. It wasn't even an Anglican present. <laughs> and, uh, they were always a little bit sort of behind, you know. And, uh, and, and they got filled with the Holy Spirit. Now there were four of them. Nobody was safe. <laughs> they began to talk to all their friends. They were fearless. They, were, they had received the baptism of fire. There was revival in this boarding school. How many pupils were there there, Harry? Hundreds, hey? Yeah, several hundred. There were many of them that got born again. Eventually the principal called them in and said, listen, no more of this praying for people. <laughs> Stop it now. But what had happened is they were all from very conservative churches where, you know, you sort of checked your brain in at the door, came, sat down, and just sat and listened, you know, and then went out and felt thankful it didn't continue very long. But, but now they had tasted something. And just across the road from this boarding school was a little Assemblies of God congregation. Dun, 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 dun. So they ventured across there. And at the door was a very elderly gentleman who may have been coming to this ashram as well. He would have fitted right in here. His name was Uncle, uncle or Brother? Brother Snowy. Brother Snowy. Because he had white hair. Right? And, uh, and, and a very red face. I've met him a couple of times. And he just beamed. He just shone. And he just welcomed these young schoolgirls, these teenagers. And they took them in and they began to disciple them. And they prayed for them. And then on Saturday nights, they would have a meeting that was in preparation for Sunday morning's communion. But Saturday night was, was um, body ministry, where you were encouraged to bring a word in tongues, bring a trans an interpretation, bring a prophetic word, move in the gifts of the Spirit, have a word of knowledge, pray for the sick. And these young ladies and their friends began to stream into this little assemblies of God congregation. And they were disciples. And then, so this is about now 1970, 74, I'm supposing it would have been, our final year at high school. And I ventured up into Zululand where I met Kerry. She used to be the the, the, uh, the captain of the Zululand netball team. And uh, you can imagine her in her skins and beads, really, can't you? And, uh, and, and then that's where she saw me. I used to play the tambourine. And she saw me and she thought, wow. <laughs> and, uh, that's, uh, that's Afrikaans for. <laughs> that's what I see. 
And, uh, and so we began to minister together. I remember us borrowing a friend's car in the most spiritual and godly way. We, we neither of us could drive. We didn't have a driver's license. I steered and used to put things and Kerry changed the gears. And we went and we did evangelism. I just think, Lord, your mercy is new every morning. Hallelujah. And so for us, this experience of the water, I was baptized in water when I was just 14 and then later on that year I was baptized in fire. And that, you know, the baptism in water was it was a bit of a wet occasion, but the baptism in fire was transformative. But it, it, it shouldn't just be a one-off thing. And so, just thinking about, Kerry's probably going to speak about this maybe tomorrow morning a little bit. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18. Be ye continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5 verse 13, uh, verse 16, sorry. Walk in the Spirit. Uh, that's the, the King James Version. The New International Version says, live in the Spirit. And then Galatians 5 verse 25 says, if we live in the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And that's not goose stepping. That's waltzing. <laughs> Keeping in step with the Holy Spirit is being sensitive to His leading. Gary used to take me ballroom dancing on a Thursday night. Painful experience for some of us. <laughs> because I would stand on toes and whatever. But but as she learned, as she learned to keep her toes out of where I was gonna put my toes, it was it was like it was like music. It was such a symphony, such a melody, and that's what the Lord wants of us. And so tonight, briefly now. Briefly, I want to bring you this thought. That this thing of revival and refreshing in Jesus is not just an experience. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. It's, it's, it's like walking in the rain. It's like living in the, in, under the very shadow of, of the cloud of God. It's, it's having that constant... Uh, refreshing and infusion from God. And so in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, okay, Acts chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully there, they were all of them accord in one place, and there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mountain wind, it filled the whole place where they were sitting. It wasn't a little breeze. There's an old English word for that. It wasn't a little zephyr. It wasn't a little breeze that just wiped it through. Ooh. Did you feel that the breeze would be the Holy Spirit? No, good heavens! They came from heaven and sound of a mighty rushing wind. People clung to their chairs. You know, Peter's cloak was flapping round his head. His sermon notes were all over the place. Good heavens, turn, tables were turned over. The curtains were flapping out of the window. And there were, they said, and then there appeared like unto cloven tongues that settled on each of them. Listen, it wasn't like a little birthday candle. No, you have a birthday candle on your head. Not at all. Not at all. This was the Holy Spirit that had arrived. Good heavens! These guys were going to turn the world upside down. They were set on fire. Goodness me! When I was in Zimbabwe ministering in the olden days, when I still had hair and it was brown, <laughs> and all my teeth, I had a friend who had a little gold mine, as you do, and uh, I popped in one day and they'd been smelting the gold, and they would put the gold slag, or whatever it was, the stuff, into a big crucible, it was about this thick, and it was about this round at the top, and about, you know, 18 inches deep, and they would lower it with these huge sort of tongs on top of, of, of a, a hole in the ground. And there was a hole in the bank, and they made a fire down there. And then at the top, they had this sort of metal structure where they would put the crucible with the oil with the gold in it. And then they would turn on a massive fan, and it would blast air through this, 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 this coal. 
and the, the flames would shoot up, just roaring out of this hole. They would take this crucible and they would lower it on top of these flames. And the flames would be shooting up and then they would lower the crucible down until whoosh, the flames roll against the bottom of the crucible and the crucible will begin to glow orange, red, orange, and then yellow, and then eventually white. And as you looked into it, it was like silver in there. It was all shiny. And when it was all molten, they would switch off the fan, put some uh, skirts, uh, um, actually they were just sacks that they fastened around their legs because of the heat, and they would pick up this thing. My friend Joe and his helper would pick it up, and they would lift this heavy crucible across, and they would pour it out carefully, because they had the precious gold in it. I arrived one day. What's this story all about, Russell? I arrived one day to find them rolling on the floor in absolute hysterics, laughing until they cried. And they had the gold was ready, and they got this massive pair of tongs. It took two of them to hold it. And they grabbed the crucible, and they picked it up, but they had forgotten to turn off the fan. And these massive flames shot out, and both, both their sacks caught fire. But now, they've got this thousands and thousands of dollars worth of liquid gold, which they're not going to drop, and they're dancing around because their legs are being burned as they carefully <laughs> replace the crucible. Right? That flame that came out of that hole was like the flames that lit upon the heads of the disciples when they were baptized with the fire from heaven. It was no little birthday candle, guys. These guys have been saved. God. Amen. They were now ready to impact the mighty Roman Empire. They were now ready to go and minister the gospel to the Jews who had just orchestrated Christ's crucifixion. They were now ready to go and lay down their lives for the gospel. This was a powerful, powerful life transforming moments. That's what happened to me when I was 14. That's what happened to Harry when she was at that school in Zululand. That's what we need in the modern church. I have such questions and frustrations about church. I think, good heavens, what is this thing? It doesn't look like anything I've seen in the Bible. You know. And yet, what do we need? We need what God's Word speaks to us about. And so on the day of Pentecost, when it, the Holy Spirit came, mighty wind, flames of fire, they spoke in tongues, they ushered out from that place, people gathered around and said, these guys are drunk. Peter said, no. Verse 17, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And he said, in the last days, gives us a certain context. Eschatologically, we are living in the last days. In the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. That's what we need. That's what we should be thirsty for. That's what the church is, is dry for. The outpouring. I will pour water on him that is thirsty. I will pour water upon the dry ground, says the Lord. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3. He's gonna, he wants to pour out his spirit. As I've been studying trends in church and, and, and things that are happening, people are saying, well, should we ditch the church? She's no longer working, is it? Let's just put, take it off the heart lung machine. I'm thinking, no, no, that's not what we need. We need, we need the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We need the latter rain. We need the former rain. We need the latter rain. Read the, read the book of Joel. Between Hosea and Amos, you'll find Joel in there. Chapter 2, from verse 20, he speaks about the, the prophecy that Peter uh, quotes. But prior to that, he mentions the former and the latter rain. And I know that there are latter rain movements, and some of them have, have had very bad press. Some of them have had excesses. But, but what the scriptures say is what captures my heart. I'm not really interested in pastors pet theories, dogmas, theologies, what our group teach, what this Bible college likes. I want to know what does God's Word say. And if God's Word says it, I want what God's Word says. Amen. And when He says, and, and He says, Joel, this is how it was just 
prophesied, in the last days, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. I have two sons and three daughters. I want them to prophesy. Amen. Yep. Your young men shall see visions. I used to, well, that, that, now but your old men will dream dreams. I'm claiming that now. <laughs> But we need to be having supernatural experiences. And upon my service and upon my handmaids, I will pour out of my spirit, said the Lord, and they will prophesy. And there will be signs in the heavens above. The sun will be dark and the moon will be turned to blood. Blood and, what's it, fire and vapor of smoke. This is what the Lord is speaking about in the last days. And so when the Holy Spirit is poured out as God has promised, and we can expect it. You can say, well, Russell, doesn't it say in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, that there'll become a falling away before Jesus comes? Yes, there will be. Matthew 24, Jesus said, because of the persecutions, the love of many will grow cold. Absolutely. But there's also a latter rain. There's also refreshing pouring of the Holy Spirit. Some may grow cold. Some may grow disillusioned. Some may become distracted. Some may be offended. But there are those who are going to press in. And they're going to say, Lord, we want what you promised. Amen. The task today is no easier than it was then. People say, we don't really need the Holy Spirit today, do we? Absolutely, we do. Come down to the mission on a Tuesday or Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Come down to the mission any day. We need the Holy Spirit to do church, to be the people of God, to be church. Amen. But when we explore the, the, the former and the latter rains that are, that are spoken of in the scriptures, the primary reason for them is the harvest. So the gifts of the Holy Spirit, I'll pour out of my spirit. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, young men dream, see visions, old men dream dreams. All these things are going to happen. Increased supernatural experiences, we need that. My wife has been praying for our children that God would give them dreams. Speak to them in dreams. We're saying, God, if you speak to the Muslims in dreams, speak to our children in dreams. She gets a call from Australia, from my nephew. I need to talk. I've had a dream. <laughs> He's not been serving Jesus. Nice enough lad. I did his wedding about four years ago. I was in Perth. He has a dream. Who can I speak to about this dream? He knows it's from God. I'll contact Uncle Russell and Auntie Harry. Uncle Russell was absolutely exhausted. And the heavy said, we've got to speak to Brad. I said, I'm going to bed. You can speak to Brad. <laughs> I went to bed. She came to bed in the early hours of the morning. She led him to Jesus. Oh, I went to bed. Listen, folks, we need to believe God for increased supernatural, for the expression and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. We need to be hungry. We need to be desperate. We need to cast aside. Shannon speaks about how some people are afraid. Oh, the Holy Spirit is going to kill me. No, it's not. He's going to thrill you. <laughs> when I met my wife, she's Afrikaans. That's a very scary thing. Right? I had a friend, an English friend, and he said, Oh, I said, but she's been on this life of yours. She's been a strong stuff, isn't she? <laughs> very much so. With this sort of stiff upper lip stuff, you know. She's very strong. You couldn't take her name properly. You used to call her Harry. You call my wife Harry. You have every right to be scared. I said, it's like riding a wild stallion, sir. Coming on for your wife. This is going to be fun. Goodness me. I am so tired of pedestrian Christianity. Domesticated. Body trained, house trained, <laughs> quaffed and groomed. No! We need Christians that glow in the dark. <laughs> the word in the Bible for you cannot be burned, you'll be surprised. Read the Greek, you'll find some interesting stuff that the word that you will not be burned is, is asbestos. <laughs> I'm saying, God, 
to be some asbestos Christians. Hey, turn up the heat. Bring it on. Why? Because greater is he that is in me. Oh, in London, there was, I went to a pastor's meeting and they said, you know, the Muslim hosts are going to come and kill us in our beds. I said, hallelujah. They <laughs> said, Russell, you don't understand. I said, I tell you what, I'd rather speak to a Muslim in Bromley than go to Afghanistan and share the gospel with him on the street. Bring him to our town in Bromley. I went round to all the Muslim shop owners and gave them all Christian Bibles in their own language. Prayed for their staff. Wow. I said, I'm coming. Look at this wonderful business. Can I pray for you? They said, oh, yes, please. I said, I'm going to pray to Jesus. That's okay. What? They just want blessing. Come on. I said, I get it. Buy a Bible in their language. Wrap it in gold paper. Take it back. I went to the one shop. I'd given the owner a Bible, but he had another guy working there. He needed a diary Bible. He was from some Iraq, I think it was. He needed a Bible. I got a Bible in diary. I had a men's Bible study. I said to one of my businessmen, come with me, we're going to do something. He said, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to buy some gold paper. We got the gold paper. We went to the music shop across the street from the tailor shop where this guy worked. I went in. Bob, who owns the music shop. Bob, if you're watching this, thank you for the cellar tape. <laughs> <laughs> went in. Bob says, how can I help you, Russell? I was well known. I was the chaplain of the town. I said, I need some cellar tape. Here we are. What are you doing? I said, I've got this Bible. And it was a small Bible in Dari. I said, I'm get across the road. Gotta go give it to Mustafa. He said, he's a Muslim. I said, he is. <laughs> <laughs> we wrapped it in gold paper. We put the cellar tape on. I said, Philip, come here. He's the businessman. Bob, he owned the music shop. He hadn't given his life to Jesus. Come and pray for me. Bob wept. <laughs> As we prayed that God would use this Bible, Bob just wept. I said, now, Bob, I'm taking Philip over the road. If we come flying out of that door, lock the front blinds and call the police. <laughs> so we went in. We went in. There's my friend, Marcus. He, he loved me to bits. I'd given him a Bible. He told me that his hometown was in the Bible. Ah. I said to him, no, where are you from? Turkey. No. I'm thinking of the travels of the Apostle Paul. I'd given him a Bible eight days earlier. He said it's in the Bible. He reaches under his counter and he pulls it out. And he's flipping through the Bible. So I look into my maps. <laughs> right in the middle of Turkey. I said, uh, he says he comes from Antikia. I said, there's no Antikia in the Bible. I've read it many times. He says, there, I'm from Antikia. I open it to maps. Antioch. I said, you're from Antioch. He said, that's it. I said, go to Acts 17. He turns there and he begins to read with great passion from the Turkish Bible. He had read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and half of Acts in eight days. He was devouring the Bible. So I go in there and I, he said, how did this year? I said, I brought a gift for Mustafa. So he stands and bellows, Mustafa! And upstairs you hear an avalanche. Because we start and decides his final day has arrived. And he sort of falls down the stairs. And all the other staff come out to see what's going to happen to Mustafa. And he comes in and, and my friend says to him, the priest is here with something for you. And he comes across and I present him this gold covered Bible. And he takes it and he says, what is it? I said, well, open it. We, we find we put so much sellotape on, he couldn't hardly get into this thing. He's trying and trying and trying. Eventually, he gets the paper off. And it's a green bound Bible. And they read from the back. And he reads on the back and he goes, so what does it say? He says, he says, this is good news for all the people. He says, what is it about? I said, you have to read it. So he opens it and he looks inside. I see his eyes get big and he says, can this be true? I said, I don't know, what does it say? It says, the Jews hated Jesus. Now, I think as an Arab, he probably felt very satisfied at that point. <laughs> I said, I read it and find out. And I said, can we pray for you now? So he prayed for him. Everyone's gathered around. They're all stood there like this because they think that's the thing to do. And we pray for him. What are we doing? We're taking the gospel to a Muslim. In Afghanistan, it's a bit more difficult. 
It was such good news that they were coming. And they were open. They were accessible. We could share the love of God. We could pray for them. And after he'd gone back to his desk, there was a young uh, Turkish lady sitting across at the side here. And she said, um, she's looking at me. I said, what is it? She said, where's my Bible? No. No. I said, I'll be back. I'll be back. <laughs> We're talking about, about it's beginning to rain. We're talking about the latter rain. We're talking about the enabling, the equipping of the Holy Spirit. Not as a one-off experience. I don't want you to go to the Christian ashram and in 10 years' time you look back and say, Oh, wasn't that a wonderful day? <laughs> no! I want you to get... I want you to go back from this place contagious. I want you to grow in boldness. I want there to be a transformation. I want there to be a new season. 1970, Carrie and I, in the early 70s, gave our lives to Jesus. It was easy to preach the gospel. We took our first church in Rhodesia during the war. We, our house will be packed from wall to wall with people crying out to God. There was not room for another body. Our Sunday afternoon meetings, there would be a man in the foyer with a pile of guns as the farmers had come in and left their guns in the entrance hall while they came into the meeting. We were on a farm one night, was attacked by the terrorists. We were crying out to God. I had my submachine gun. Kerry was pregnant with our next child. We're crying out to God. They're shooting thousands of rounds of bullets off at the farmhouse. They blasted a hole in the fence. They shot eight dogs dead. And then they fled into the night. Went out in the morning to when they blasted a hole in the fence. The ground was six inch deep in shells. We examined the farmhouse. One bullet had hit the corner of the roof. Other than that, they hadn't managed to hit the building. <laughs> it does make your heart rate go up a bit when they start to do that something. But the Young people, we had Wesley. Wesley was 17 months old. I was 21. We took off. What was it? What was it that took us to that place at that time? There was a fire in our bones. We sat down as young adults and we talked about what will happen if you get killed? What will happen if I get raped? What will happen if our son gets killed? At that time, we made, we made our peace. We, we decided this is it. De death may be a part of the equation, but obedience is not questionable. There was a fire. Forty something years later, the fire burned still. Back in the 70s, it was easy. We were traveling to the border of Zimbabwe on one occasion. We began to count the people we had led to Jesus. We stopped and we got to 400. It was easy to lead people to Jesus. Now it's hard. All the more reason that we need that baptism of fire. That encouragement, that empowering, that anointing, that equipping. We need it. Need it. My appeal to you is do not draw back. When Shannon brought that prophetic word, I saw such a picture in my spirit of this glorious waves crashing on the shore, and we're standing there, and the voice says, Plunge in. Don't hold back. Plunge in. But, 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 but don't hold back. I might get my hair wet. What about my makeup? Right? <laughs> I, I have a brought a change of clothes. Plunge in. Plunge in. We need. What does the church need? Well, if we got rid of our pews and got some comfortable chairs, it might help. If we got a more eloquent pastor who has all his teeth, it could only help. If we got a better sound system, a more gifted choir, plusher carpets, air conditioning, modern lighting. No, no, a thousand times no. What does the world need? It needs a church that is baptized in fire. That has experienced the power of God. That is, people say, these people are drunk. Have you seen that Chadwick when he gets going? I'm sure he's had a couple of whiskeys in him before he gets up there. People will say, no, this is, this is different. This is vital. This is desperate. This is 
essential. This is what we need. This is what we need. We're going to pray for you. I don't know if there's anyone here who needs prayer. I know that I, I need prayer. I know that I need to be encouraged. I need to be empowered. I need to be refreshed. We, need, we want to pray for you. If you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, you feel like you've leaked out a little bit. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Sometimes we do grow, grow a little dry. We'll pray for you. I'm going to be praying that Dave gets more of his prayer language. God's given him a couple of words. He wants to give him a full language. I know that Shannon's going to be praying. And I'm sure that Ed will be praying. Kerry will be praying. If you really want something to happen, get Kerry to pray for you. Goodness me. Kerry, is there anything you want to add to what I said? No, I should have stopped long ago. I know that. Okay.